OK, students, so we're back and we're going to do part four of the lab. And so this part is the hydrologic mapping. And so uh, what I would suggest you do is create a new group layer and rename that hydrology so that we can put our new files right in there and keep ourselves organized. For hydrology tools, everything that we're going to use is going to be under spatial analyst tools. And within that, you can see there's a toolbox called hydrology. I have given you the step by step kind of workflow of those tools in your lab document. But essentially what you do is first fill the digital elevation model because it models channels based upon flow of water over the Earth's surface, but it can't deal with holes or little internally drained basins because uh, it doesn't model pressure gradients flowing up and over like a, a little um, pond in your river or a little uh, basically pool. And so we have to make our DEM smooth uh, to make it work. OK, so what we're going to do is start with that. And I'm going to close this profile tool. And so we would input our DEM. San Rafael DEM, because this is a derivative product of the DEM. And we're going to make this fill surface raster. OK, so I'm going to let the choose the name of all of these because I'm not really interested in these particular files right now. They're just the outputs. It's going to go to my default geodatabase. And then I'm going to tuck the new file. It's going to show up at the front. I'm going to tuck it into hydrology tools here. So run. The next thing that we'll do after that finishes, and it will take a minute, is uh, what's called flow direction raster. And so that is the first step in working towards creating a hydrologic network. And so basically what it does is uh, it makes a calculation of from what neighboring pixel will water flow or to or from. And so it'll be a map of the whole area and it'll tell it which of its neighbors the water flows to. From there, we'll make a flow accumulation raster, which will then calculate how many pixels flow into each pixel in the map. So these are neighborhood um, geospatial operations. OK, so here comes our, our fill DEM. So it sh looks very much like the other DEM. Can't tell the difference, but it shouldn't have these holes. So I popped it into hydrology tools. And from here on out, we'll operate on the fill. OK, so now we're going to do flow direction. We'll input our fill DM in the hydrology set, and it's going to output a flow direction raster. And we can, and it's D8 because there's eight neighboring cells. You could choose other options, but I tend to go with the default. OK, so that'll be running for a minute. As it's running, we can chat a bit. So we'll get this flow direction raster. From that, we'll calculate accumulation. And that map is going to look really weird. It's going to look like kind of it's going to be stretched like a DEM. But some pixels will have lots of other pixels going into them. Those are rivers, right? And then others, and this will be the majority of pixels, won't have many other channels or pixels that flow into them. And those would be the, the hill slopes of the landscape. Uh, but we'll see it looks kind of funky. This also looks funky. So there's our flow direction raster. That's just a processing tool for us, not a visualization tool. So I'm going to not show it. Um, and I'm going to pop it down in here. OK, so flow accumulation is next. So pay attention to what it asks for. It wants the flow direction raster. So flow direction of the fill, and it's going to output a flow accumulation raster. If you make sure you're happy with these names so you don't forget what you're doing, and we'll go with the defaults on the rest and click run. This step will take the longest, but like I was saying, it's going to output a map that almost looks like a, 
a dark map with like a white river flowing through it. Uh, but it's really just a map of how many pixels flow into every other pixel. Um, and so we'll classify it to stream and not stream or river and not river. Um, and the kind of cutoff of what a river and a hill slope is, is going to be variable by the climate of the landscape you're working in, but also the pixel size, right? Because it's a function of how much upstream area there is before you get enough runoff to produce a channel. And that's also going to be product of your climate. So this is a pretty dry climate. We're using a 10 meter pixel. I tend to find that for a 10 meter pixel in Utah, in the semi-arid climate, about a thousand other pixels are required to make a channel. And so we, we'll, we'll try that and see if that works. I'll also show you some kind of intermediates uh, or other options, like if you did 10,000, what would it look like? Or if you did 100, what would it look like? Uh, you want to kind of tune it to what the visual products of your data look like. OK, so to help us with that, I think I need to move up um, I need to turn off the fill because well, that's not a visualization tool. OK, so now we can see the channels and we're going to produce this low accumulation raster and we want to see that it looks like it has channels. OK, so you can only see like one river here, which is probably the Green River. Because it's the biggest river there, but if we go to symbology for our flow accumulation and instead of having a stretched symbology, we'll go to classify to stream and not stream. And we don't want five classes, we want two classes. And um, and then we will change the colors to not stream will be no color. And stream will be whatever color we want it to be. Um, for it to show up here, I guess I'll choose blue to start off with. And so, you know, this is the total number, the highest number of pixels that flow to anything else is like, a bunch, right? So uh, I told you that the cutoff is going to be about a thousand. So let's try that for this upper value of no stream. And now we see a lot of blues. So if we zoom into the landscape, we can see blues roughly following where channels are. There are some where it doesn't work, like right here, I can see a channel that's not highlighted in blue. If I wanted that to show up, then I would make this a little smaller. Like if I did 500, how does it look? Well, now we got that channel, but we may have others that maybe we didn't want. Or maybe you like this. You like it, you go with it. Uh, this is just a model, and it's a visualization model, you know. Um, and it's going to vary by aspect too, right? Because in one slope direction, maybe. Um, you know, you're going to get more water accumulation than another slope facing direction just because of solar insulation. But yeah, 500 is not bad. I would say it's producing a lot of little channels, which look like they appear there in terms of the slope shade map or the hill shade. Um, so yeah, somewhere between 500 and 1,000. If we go to 10,000, you know, we've lost a lot of channels so it really depends on what you want do you want to just show the main trunk streams do you want to see details um, then you would change this uh, a little differently but i'll go with my usual thousand okay so uh but these are rasters and so there's pixels we've just not shown most of them um, but so then you can see we're going to reclassify this as a binary grid OK, so to do that, we go back to geoprocessing. And we go to. Um, stream to feature, so we'll have a converts a raster representing streams to a feature. So we're going to input our. Um, flow accumulation. 
this should work. You have to also put the flow direction one in here. Actually, let's do it a little different. OK, so let's go back. So there's actually another tool. It's called conversion tools, and we're going to go from raster to polyline. Oh, sorry, I skipped a step. No, wrong. OK, so go back to high. Um, go back to spatial analyst, and actually what we want to do is this. So we're not in hydrology tools. We want to go to reclass toolbox. We're going to reclassify. OK, so we're going to input this flow accumulation raster and you can see that it takes what we've classified as in these different values. And we're saying that this classification of 0 to 1000, which we called no streams, we're going to give it a, a value. Um, we could give it the value of one, but I'm actually going to call it no data like no data is called. And then the ones that I called streams, you can call it any number you want. We can call it river. I'm just calling it one. One will be streams. OK, so now I'll run that. That shouldn't take too long. It's going to just put a make a raster where pixels will be where those 1000 flowed uh, pixels are of streams. So I should, I'll turn off this other one so we'll see it appear. Drop that down in here, minimize it. And remember, I'm, I'm outputting these into the Geo database, so not worrying too much about the names, although they give some intuition. OK, it did produce a flow map, but it actually seems to be classified for some reason. Let's go to that. There shouldn't really be any other values than one, so let's say discrete. Actually, let's go back to classify. Let's look at the histogram for a second. What's going on here? OK. Yeah, it looks like the histogram is at one, so I don't know what's going on there, but um, yeah. All right. Should have worked. OK, so values of one are the river and they're yellow and we can see no oranges, right? So that would OK, should have worked. OK, so we'll go back to geoprocessing. OK, so now we have this river map. So now we take this stream to feature, reclass flow, and put in our flow direction raster. And then we call, we can create a new polyline, which will be called rivers. Okay, and we'll run that. Uh, the reason to display it as a line as opposed to rasters because it opens up a whole bunch of other things that we can do and the visualization is just a higher quality. Um, you can see that the the raster doesn't really show up so well across this landscape. Uh, the vector will show up much better. We can tune the width of the line. We could even use things like uh, um, topology right to model downstream flow in this channel, etc. So now I can turn off the reclass flow, pop that down there. Um, but our rivers are here. I've got them as green for whatever reason, so we could change that. If you want your rivers to be blue, apply. If you don't like that, you want them to be yellow and show up really well. There they are. You could do whatever you want, right? Boom, there's our rivers. OK, so the next thing after convert your streams to a feature, which we've done, is to calculate a watershed. And so this is just going to be example watershed. You can actually, you could do this. Why would you do this? Well, you might want to know what's the area above like um, some site along a river that you're studying uh, for water chemistry, um, or maybe you're measuring stream flow along our stream gauge. 
you want to know what's the upstream contributing area. So you could make um, some uh, custom watersheds, right? Because the watershed changes as you go downstream. OK, so there's a watershed tool here. And the first thing you need to do is input the flow direction raster. OK, so make sure to choose that one. And then you have to choose a uh, intersection of one of the streams to pour the water into or calculate what water flows to that point. So we have a tool to start us off, which is to create a new point. OK, and so I'm just going to make one example. It doesn't matter which watershed you choose. You could choose the Green River, uh, but I'm going to choose one of these little watersheds coming into the San Rafael swell or across it. And so I'll choose one with some significant size. I'll choose this one right here. How about? And so you can see that I kind of snap to the river network. So I'll make my point. OK, and. Now. One thing you got to check on. Is the pour point field, so if we look in the attribute table. Pour point field. The integer value has null. That's no good. OK, so let's. First off, change it to object ID. OK, and this might work. It also might not work uh, because if I turn back on my flow accumulation raster, reclassified, we might see that they don't perfectly intersect. Here it looks like they do, but you can see like what if I had chosen right here? It wouldn't have intersected. And it might not create the watershed, but I think this one's going to work. If it doesn't work, I would have to back up, snap, use a tool called Snap Pour Point, and then it would work because it looks and buffers in the neighborhood to make sure it's snapped to the network. Okay, but let's just run this and see that it works. And so, yeah, we're making a watershed above that point. Another way to go perhaps would have been to make a polygon that covered a lot of this area, and that would probably, then you wouldn't even need to run the snap tool either. But this one worked, and we could see that it was well snapped, and boom, that black area that you see there is your watershed area that flows to that point. So very cool. Um, you can also convert that watershed because right now it's a raster with a value of one. Um, but we can go up to what's called conversion tools. And within conversion tools, we can go from raster to polygon. So if we input that watershed, whoops, that watershed and make a uh, New polygon, which I'll call watershed EG example, and run it. And so again, I'm saving the geodatabase. It'll figure out the file extension for me. Okay, so great. I'm going to turn off and put that in there, put this in there. Uh, then this is cool because we can symbolize however we want this to look. You could have it, a, you know, a black outline with a thick line, and you could have kind of a, I don't know what color, uh, purple fly. So then we can see it across this landscape. Probably my river's line is too thick, so I can make that 0 0.25 and apply that. 
and then you know maybe you're you're then satisfied with how this looks i'm not sure maybe you think 0 0.5 was too far so 0 0.5 fly that maybe looks a little bit better right um, so yeah, you've created a visualized a watershed in this landscape. And so you could proceed from there and submit something like that. Um, one other thing that you might want to do would be to go to that watershed and go to its appearance, and give it a transparency. So maybe you wanna see some of the landscape through the watershed and you could make it more transparent so just kind of as a shadow of the area you're looking but yeah that's uh, that's pretty cool i think so yeah go ahead from there that's um that's all you needed to do for this hydrologic mapping section uh if you want to know what the area of that watershed is uh you can get that from its uh properties i believe if you go to the you can get extent. Um, well, actually, I think we get it from the attribute table. Go to attribute table. Yeah, there's our shape area in square meters and our length of our border. Um, yeah, so you can get really quantitative information out of that as well. OK, so we'll stop this one and we'll be back for um, the Landsat part of the lab next.